Chandrayaan-3. Countdown to landing, but I'm going to say it again. It's not a countdown to a touchdown. It's a countdown to a history. Uh, we've got the former ISRO chairman with us, G. Madhavan Nair. Uh, again, always a pleasure to be speaking to you, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Nair. Uh, we were just looking at this documentary where you were, you know, you were featured in this documentary and you spoke extensively on why we're trying to attempt this South Pole mission. You spoke about the equator region. I heard uh, some opinion about, you know, water's presence being there uh, closer to the equator. Would you like to throw some more light? We were earlier discussing if at all our lander today lands inside a crater, the possibilities might be numerous, but there's going to be no sunlight. So what is the exact geography of the region? Uh, can you throw some light on the topography of the region and why it's important that we have a smooth landing today? Uh, <clears throat> as uh, I mentioned earlier, the equatorial region uh, it is subjected to very heavy dose of uh, solar radiation. Uh, the heat level are very high. Daytime it reaches uh, nearly 200 degrees Celsius, and night it may be about minus 150 degrees or so. So, in that condition, uh, entire water in the region evaporates. And uh, hmm. what hmm. the Chandrayaan could find earlier was that uh, hydroxyl molecules are embedded in various compounds uh, on the surface of the moon. Uh, but at the same time, the, our investigation has clearly shown that near the South Polar region, the craters, there are huge deposits of ice. And uh, that is something which confirms uh, the theoretical uh, hypothesis also. The moon, while when just spun off from the Earth uh, 4.5 billion years back, uh, it carried a lot of water and most of it has got evaporated except what is there in the craters near the South Pole. Uh, there, the, there's practically there's no sunlight falling on those region, and there's no heating, and uh, ice uh, uh, is there uh, below the surface. Uh, again, the, this mm. region is almost like a virgin material. Uh, we may get some idea about the origin of the moon and the planet the Earth at the time of separation and so on from looking at it, but this uh, this is only a small beginning to expose such details. And uh, there is a, a, a complement of uh, sensors which is carried in the Chandrayaan-3. Right. Right. We'll uh, make the in-situ measurements to confirm whatever remote observation we have made in the Chandrayaan-1 and Chandrayaan-2. Varghese, uh, uh, former ISRO chairman with us, uh, any queries? Because, uh, you know, uh, Varghese here is a science aficionado. Uh, he really tracked Chandrayaan 2 as well, uh, Dr. Nair. Uh, would you like to throw some queries to the former ISRO man? Well, uh, Dr. Nair, I mean, I, I just wanted to know that uh, what is the actual position when we come to the moon? Because everybody is trying to return to the moon. The Russians are trying to return to the moon. We are trying to explore the moon. The Chinese have been there. Uh, the Americans have come with the Artemis mission. So is it that we are planning to go to the moon for what purpose? Is it to become the staging ground to interplanetary explorations uh, from there? What is the actual mission about going and exploring the moon? Uh, there are uh, several reasons behind it. Uh, the first and foremost is to find a suitable location for permanent observatory uh, beyond the Earth's uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, of course, the space station is one solution, but it is a very prohibitively expensive to maintain. Uh, if we have an outpost on the moon, that can become an observatory without the uh, disturbance of the atmosphere, and which can be looking at the uh, neighbors the neighboring planets, the solar system, the uh, stars, galaxies, and beyond. So the, such an observatory, uh, there are various possibilities. It can be an unmanned station or a manned station and so on. Uh, the next comes uh, the possibility of uh, uh, having exp uh, the, the exploiting the resources, if possible. Uh, helium-3, there are huge deposits on the moon. And uh, of course, as uh, everybody is aware, it is the ideal fuel for fusion reaction. Uh, a small quantity of uh, helium-3 can sustain the energy for days together uh, for the country. So whether we can uh, collect this helium-3 from there and safely bring to Earth is one big question. Again, the deposits of titanium and several other exotic materials, we don't know the presence of 
uh, the nuclear materials and uh, so on. But at the same time, the helium-3 and the titanium compounds, the aluminium, uh, these elements are confirmed. So whether economically we can exploit this is the next question which is coming. Dr. Nair, Dr. Of, Nair if, 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 if I could just interject here and my apologies, uh, just wanted to know that you know you use the word exploit, economical exploitation. Do you think that should be our first step? I mean, there are several people who are commenting on social media today that you know after we've destroyed the earth, now we're setting out for the next planets. No, it's not a question of us uh, destroying. You know, we need resources uh, for hmm. the human sustenance of the human civilization. So, how effectively we can utilize the resources uh, which are accessible to us in an effective manner? Without, without destroying right. it. Uh, so that's the kind of philosophy we should take. And uh, I'm sure uh, the planet Earth has got uh, its limited resources and the population is growing, our demands will be growing. And accordingly, we should be looking for alternate sources for supply of various kinds of material. So that way, the moon becomes a, a nearby source uh, where we may be able to get meter, materials similar to what is there on the Earth. And more than that, I told you, uh, helium-3 will not be reaching here because the atmosphere stops it. Uh, and uh, on the moon, whereas there are huge deposits of helium-3 uh, in the uh, titanium compounds, mm. it is mm. formed by remote observation. And that is going to be a big boom uh, for the atomic power. It is a non-polluting atomic fuel. And uh, certainly it is going to be a great uh, advantage for the humanity. Well, Dr. Nair, also one more thing uh, that uh, is kind of worrisome for me is also this. Um, I'm all for exploration. I want uh, more as, uh, you know, space exploration to be there. But is it going to kickstart a kind of a space uh, war kind of a competition? Because in 2030, the Chinese are planning to have a base on the moon and mm. they're talking about mm. colonizing and they have big ambitions as such. But that is actually a military-driven kind of a project. So the militarization of space is again going to be very uh, problematic and militarization of the moon also could be problematic, isn't it? Uh, almost all spacefaring nations are part of the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. And uh, we are all committed to using the outer space for peaceful purpose alone. And the Chinese also are bound by that uh, treaties which are evolved by the UN corpus. Uh, certainly, uh, militarization is not a good idea at all, and the moon is not the place where the, we can take advantage of such militarization. Of course, the low Earth orbit has the potential of uh, militarization uh, for, from various points of view. One is the space-based assets are being used for the country's defense and uh, vital needs, and any uh, attack on that can be uh, disastrous. So, so protecting the assets uh, in space becomes important and uh, we, we have to be taking action on that. At the same time, destroying others' uh, uh, the space assets uh, is not ethical and uh, no country should be attempting that. And even parking weapons on the uh, outer space is uh, uh, rather prohibited, uh, not by law, but by moral obligation uh, by all the countries globally. And Moon, of course, is declared as a common uh, property of the humanity and no specific country can claim uh, any uh, ownership on the region where it lands or occupies. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're also getting some reactions. We're also going to quickly play those reactions out, uh, Dr. Nair. But, um, you know, coming away from uh, the scientific aspect of it, uh, I just wanted to know what's your opinion. It is a big day. It's going to be such a huge achievement. We're so close, Dr. Nair, to finally become uh, the fourth uh, nation, uh, you know, in the entire world to a, a successfully soft land on the dark side of the moon, on the south pole of the moon. Chandrayaan 1, that earth-shattering, uh, you know, um, uh, experiment that it carried out and we found water on the moon's, uh, you know, surface. Today, everybody, you know, from the mosques to the, uh, you know, uh, to temples, to various uh, churches, everybody in unison is only praying for the best of Chandrayaan 3. Your, your viewpoint on that, sir. Uh, well, the Chandrayaan-3 is uh, very, very crucial. Uh, as I told, the Chandrayaan-2 had a very narrow miss and uh, all the corrective actions which ISRO has taken will be validated in the Chandrayaan-3. 
of course a large number of uh, simulations and design modifications have implemented which uh, i am sure will lead to a success uh, in this uh, attempt which we are going to make soon uh, and of course in all these ventures uh, everyone believes that the god's grace also is an element which has to be reckoned with and that's why the prayers are taking place all over the country well varghese um, it's going to be you know really exciting to take a look at the telecast i am trying to understand what will be telecast live dr nair can you throw some light on that because um, i mean what will we see will we see the entire landing process or it's going to be just a number uh, you know couple of numbers and data figures and telemetry on the screen uh, we will uh, will we get live cast shots uh, from the isro space station uh, what's going to happen uh well uh, i am not a uh, preview of the details uh, but at the same time from whatever we have done in the past uh, there will be a typical trajectory parameters uh, that is the time versus altitude velocity and uh, orientation and so on displayed on the screen and with the possible bounds of performance for normal uh, landing uh, so this will be displayed primarily then also uh, there could be graphics which depict the various operation sequence and so on based on the signals what we receive from the uh, lander and the mm -hmm. final rover uh, these signals will be displayed in the last screens in the control center at bangalore all right and uh, you know what uh, we were talking about the difficulties that uh, the vikram lander has already you know overcome there's a narrow margin of error when you're inserting your a uh, module into the lunar orbit uh, you know the accuracy and trajectory is something that one has to focus on because all different sides of the moon affect the lander module differently there are different various pulls but now dr nair once the landing is successful there might be a lot of lunar dust as well there might be a lot of hot gases and dust there is uh, you know uh, people are speculating that it might just disrupt um, uh, some uh, you know functions functionalities of the lander is that a possibility um well of course uh, the, the area where we are going to land uh, there will be a lot of dust uh, suddenly it will be kicked up by the rocket motors but the mission mm. sequence is planned in such a way that the rocket motors are throttled to a very low level as it approaches the lunar surface and in addition uh, the last uh, few uh, meters of fall uh, the rocket engines will be shut off so that the direct blast from the rocket will not kick up the dust and also uh, even if it is uh, the dust are uh, rising up uh, it will mm. allow sufficient mm. time uh, to settle down before the rover moves out uh, for exploration